Welcome, everyone. My name is Marco Melfi, and I will be hosting tonight's conversation with Adriana A. Davies, author of From Sojourners to Citizens, Alberta's Italian History. I'd like to thank the Writers Guild of Alberta for putting on the event. And before I introduce Adriana, I just wanted to provide a quick overview of how the event will go. We have about 45 minutes together. Adriana will read a few excerpts from her book, and then I'll ask a few questions. Actually, I have a lot of questions to ask her because I really enjoyed reading the book. Uh, but we encourage those who are tuning in live to also share a question or a comment in the chat, which you can do so on the right-hand side. I'll do my best to get to as many as we can. And a thank you, a big thank you in advance to Dorothy Bentley, Bentley who is managing the tech for us. Uh, now to the book and to Adriana. Uh, Adriana A. Davies, Calvaiere d'Italia, Order of Canada recipient, an Order of Canada recipient, was born in Italy, grew up in Canada, and has a doctorate from the University of London, England. She authored From Realism to Abstraction, The Art of J.B. Taylor, The Rise and Fall of, and also The Rise and Fall of Emilio Riello, and The Frontier of Patriotism, Alberta and the First World War. And now, Sojourners to Citizens. Uh, Adriana, this was a wonderful book to read. I'm really excited. I was really uh, happy to read it, and I'm really excited to be in conversation with you. And uh, my first question uh, before we get into a reading of the book was, uh, why was it important to write this book and focus on Alberta's uh, Italian immigrants and Italian Canadian history? I think that, you know, there's a serious reason and then maybe a serious, equally serious one, but funny. I'll start with the funny. Um, in 2016, I was asked by the Edmonton Heritage Council to do the cultural mapping of the Italian community for their Edmonton uh, City as Museum project. And so I went to the basement, dug up oral history tapes from 1983. I mean, all sorts of materials that I've acquired over the years. And once I finished that assignment, I realized that if I didn't write the book, um, <clears throat> all that knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'd acquired over all of these years would disappear. And, you know, my sons might very well take those boxes to the dump. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's one reason why I wrote the book, but also because having studied that Italian history and, and really having focused on immigration history, social history, in terms of my work in the museum field, I realized that those regional perspectives were essential to fill out that narrative of, of, of nation building. Yeah, I think I, uh, growing up in Ontario, uh, the son of uh, uh, Italian immigrants, one from uh, my father's from Molise, my mother's from Sicily, um, and having read not every uh, history, but a lot of uh, Canadian or uh, Italian Canadian history, I've always found a focus has been on Eastern Canada. Um, but now that I live in Edmonton and Alberta, I really appreciated um, hearing and learning about the Italian contribution in in uh, in Alberta, but also how it contributes to the, to uh, the Canadian, Italian Canadian history overall. Um, I'm gonna ask you, I think you have a, our first uh, chance to hear from you uh, and a, a specific passage in the book. And I think you're gonna take us back to some of the earliest uh, immigrants who came and worked in, in mining. Um, so I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks Marco, just con a context. About two thirds of the coal mining in Canada occurred in um, mostly in the area from the Kootenays, Fernie, uh, through um, the Crow's Nest Pass, Lethbridge, and into the Drumheller area. And of course, there were over 200 coal mines in the Edmonton area as well. I mean, it was a different kind of coal. So the industry was incredibly important. And that shift from, uh, you know, with the railways being built, you needed uh, more efficient fuel. And so the coal mines opened. And so the Italians who came as sojourners, um, then they decided to settle and many uh, found their first jobs in coal mines. And so I thought <clears throat> I'd um, read an excerpt. Um, this is not the earliest period, but very early. Um, Giovanni John Marconi, um, and the Italian was Mucciarone, was born in uh, Sant'Angela Campobasso and arrived in St. John, New Brunswick around 1903 and traveled to Montreal. 
He worked in construction in Montreal and spent the summers on CPR gangs in Western Canada as a water boy. In 1906-1907, he ended up in Lille working in the mine as a chute loader. According to son Jack, and I quote, one day at work, a dead man came down the chute and into the mine car he was loading. It upset him so much, he quit the mine and got a job as a porter at the Lille Hotel, end quote. John followed Grand Union <coughs> Hotel owner George Clare to Coleman in 1909-1910, where he met his future wife, Margaret Mary Davidson, a hotel employee, and they married in 1911. Because of better pay, John returned to mine work as a teamster at the International Mine in 1914, a position he held until 1930. At that point, he became a blacksmith's helper and worked in this area until retirement in 1954. Jack noted that his father was illiterate and lost his passport and could not prove the correct spelling of his name. And therefore, there were many variants. He eventually had it legally changed to Marconi. The couple had four children, Jack, Gordon, Francis, and Catherine. Jack Marconi, who was born in 1915, did not go to high school. He does not say why, though it is clear in his brother Toby's history that the family was desperately poor and the children had to go to work as soon as they were of age. He was lucky to get a job at the International Mine as a trapper, an individual who opened the mine, the mine doors to allow coal cars to get in and out and observed, quote, my wage was 350 a day. Work at the mines was very slack and unsettled during this period. And in 1932, we had a bitter strike, which saw a lot of tensions between the miners in which there was a wide variety of different nationalities. I witnessed the picket line at Bellevue and the violence that erupted between the RCMP and the miners and their wives. When the strike was finally settled and work resumed, ill feelings still persisted because of the discrimination against a number of men who were not rehired. It's important to say that, you know, those sojourners who worked on the railways, at the beginning, they were used as strike breakers, but eventually they clued in and they became strongly um, unionist. And of course it was the United Mine Workers um, of America. And in Alberta, they also supported the one big union where they, uh, these visionaries wanted to see the different guilds, as it were, or different crafts done away with that would increase the bargaining power uh, of the union. And the, um, the Drumheller miners in, 20, in 1919, the strike, the, um, you know, the, the strike there lasted um, for nearly nine months, the longest of any of those strikes in Canada. And Italians were in the picket lines. Yeah, the, the book, um, I, I, many of the people profiled in the book were, were laborers. Uh, and, and like you mentioned, some came for the railroad initially, some came for uh, mining, um, working class individuals, some with skills, many, many without or no education. And, and many had to take on second jobs, even while they were working this, their, their actual, actual jobs. Um, I, there was one, one quote that really stuck out uh, from a family from Coleman that I think sums up a, that consistent theme within the book. Um, the quote is, they did not achieve great material success, but their honest labor earned them a good living. Why was it important to focus on these individuals, these families, these stories, um, like the one that you described? Well, I felt that, um, you know, generally speaking, they're statistics. You know, 15% so, um, of the coal for uh, the work, the coal mining workforce in the Crow's Nest Pass was of Italian origin. Um, in in Blairmore, um, Coleman, and so on, it was as high as 19 to 20%. Wow. And so you saw the most, the least social mobility in these deeply working class areas where the mine managers were of British origin and the miners were Southern Europeans, Eastern 
Europeans. And so you had um, that caste system and that the relative security of, of the, of, uh, you know, of mine work, although it was dangerous and there were oh. strikes in comparison to tilling the land. I mean, it was very difficult to get a return as a result of homesteading. But you saw so that you saw in certain areas, for example, the Lethbridge area, you know, down to Drumheller, um, the men would work in the mines and the wives and the children would run the farms. I mean, so that mm -hmm. you, you saw the, the best of both worlds, but you also saw greater social mobility and emphasis on education in those, um, in the agricultural communities and also um, in, in urban areas because very early on, um, parents quickly grasped that their children had to receive a very full education to really imp improve their lot in the world. Yeah, and that's another thing too that I, that I know, so I'm gonna come back to it, but I, I, I realized I, I did wanna ask also, um, as you mentioned, you know, coming to Canada and working in some of these situations would also be, um, the pay was seductive. I think that's another quote that I, I took out, um, but it was dangerous as you mentioned. But many that came, um, some went back, but many started more and more started to stay. And so I was curious if you could uh, uh, provide some context as to, you know, wh why did they want to leave Italy? Why was it, why was it um, even with the risks and, and you, you document, I think, well, um, some of the successes, even the modest successes for some of these families, but also a lot of the risks and, and obstacles and uh, challenges and, and the deaths that happened, even uh, with the work that they were doing. Um, but they still came and they stayed. And so what did they leave behind? What was, um, what was worth it versus what they, what they had it or known in, in Italy? Well, immigration really was an immigration of poverty. And I think it wasn't just Italians, it, it was others. I mean, and, and with other communities, Jewish communities, there were the pogroms in, in, in Russia and so on. Um, Italy was unified more or less in, in 1861. And, you know, industry was located by and large in the northern part of the country, but, you know, the center and south were extremely poor and they were agrarian economies. And the Italian inheritance system, um, unlike the British, which was intended to keep um, the land in the hands of the eldest son, you know, primogeniture. In Italy, they were parceled out. And so you can imagine these small holdings, you know, becoming smaller and smaller so that you couldn't raise a family. And, and so that initially they came because they wanted to make money to send home and to, you know, build a new house, whatever, purchase land, improve their lot in Italy. But then, of course, you know, some of them really did fall in love with the country because in the period um, 1861 to 1914, over 14 million Italians, Italian men largely immigrated. And the favorite destination was the US. And of course, Canada was nearby and the border was very porous. So work, you know, they would be working in the railways in Nevada then up to, the Spokane area then, you know, Crow's Nest Pass, you know, you name it, then to Winnipeg. I mean, so those labor chains moved back and forth between the two countries. Um, Argentina was also a, a favored country, favored destination, Venezuela, um, Australia, you know, and also a lot went to the south of France. I mean, a lot of Italians run vineyards, still run vineyards in the south of France, mm -hmm. and they also went to Germany and parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So that, but by 1900, they had decided they were going to stay, and so that's when the women come, and the women come, and families become a part of the narrative. And that's a that's a great uh, segue because I was going to ask uh, you focus or a lot of the early immigrants as you mentioned were men 
but more and more women start to come, but, and, and you, you uh, make a lot of space and, and profile um, their contribution, their, uh, their own success. And, and before I get into some questions, I was wondering if you could read a, another excerpt that focuses on that. Yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. <clears throat> Giovanni John <clears throat> Masciangelo was born in 1883, left Italy in 1901, found work in Montreal <clears throat> with the assistance of a labor agent and then moved to St. Catharines, Ontario to lay tracks for the Great Western Railway. The year 1904 was important. John went back to Italy to do two years of military service and brothers Daniele, Dan and Nicola decided to immigrate and went to St. Catharines to work. John returned to Montreal in 1906, where he became friends with John Battle, formerly Angelozzi. There are several stories as to who made the decision to go west. John's wife, Jean, and it's interesting that with these two families, the women are the historians, and they're the ones who wrote the stories for the local histories of the, the Delia Craig Mile area, because of course those local histories are an incredible resource. And so, and Jean says that um, at the St. Catharines train station around 1908, <clears throat> they saw a poster stating, go west and homestead. The fare to Winnipeg was $10. Um, the friends left and worked for some farmers at Christmas City for two months, and then continued to a Vancouver um, for a fare of $35. And then eventually after a stint at mining in Blairmore, they did, she writes, they decided in 1909 to go homesteading. So they came out to the north side of the Hand Hills and picked out the homestead side by side. Um, John Marshall took SW, you know, I'm not gonna read the homestead number. And so these were adjacent. And she says, the friendship of these two men continued through life. They were like brothers. The cost of the homestead was $10 for 160 acres. They had to break 30 acres and build a $300 house, which they did. And after six years, they were allowed a preemption quarter section at 3,000 an acre. And, you know, various members of the fa family were sponsored and continued um, to settle. <clears throat> Dan's daughter um, and uh, Gladys Lewis um, talks ab about these operations. And she also said, Dan and John operated a mine on the north side of the Hand Hills and got coal from there for years after. Um, the three of them lived in a so-called shack on Dan's farm. Then in 1912, Dad went back to Italy to get married. So you see, you know, you go home, and sometimes you knew the girl, sometimes it was an arranged marriage. And um, so he married Grace Lugiano, who was only 16 years old. From the way they spoke about it afterwards, I think they loped. Grace was totally unfitted to roughing it. Not only was she homesick, she couldn't cook and had to be shown how to make simple things by her husband. Because, you know, although the examples that I've given are, you know, laborers and illiterate. Um, the coal mining records, which are in the Crow's Nest Museum, are incredibly literate and well written in Italian. And, you know, I've derived a great deal of information from those records. And certainly, uh, from what I gather, half to two thirds had the basic education, which was about grade one to, gr to grade six at that point. But I mean, they were studying the classics, so they mm -hmm. condensed a, a great deal into those years. But Grace says, the, lo uh, the granddaughter says, the loneliness that Grace felt on the land was the same as that experienced by many pioneer women. The family's tragedies were also those of other pioneers. They, these began when Nick died in 1911 or 1912, accounts vary, as a result of an abscessed tooth. He was 23. The brothers were working on construction of irrigation ditches in the Bassano and Brooks area. So a lot of Italians were to, on, the, on the irrigation canals and the dams. They took Nick to a dentist in Brooks, but the tooth was so badly infected 
that it could not be removed. Lockjaw developed and he died a very painful death shortly after. Um, the close relationship between the brothers is noted in all the family histories. Dan was the first to marry and he married Grace. John returned to Italy in 1913 and married Giacinta, Jean Antonelli. And like her husband, who was barely literate, Jean had attended school and notes in the family history. I had learned to crochet, knit, spin, and weave linen. At one time, I was able to weave 12 different patterns in linen. Thus, I had a very nice diary of homemade linens to bring to Canada with me. Seven pairs of sheets, 12 towels, 20 serviettes, and many pairs of, of pillowcases. She recounts that as, as a city girl, she felt alien, but decided to learn English and adapt to her new circumstances. Their housing was primitive. They started in a one room shack. Water had to be brought in from the well and a small coal stove was used for cooking and heating. Jean continues, we had four horses with which we did the farming and also were used for driving teams. Groceries and shopping were got from Stetler or Munson and the Hand Hill store where we also got our mail. Then the CN Railway came through Highland, now Delia, and businesses opened in town. From then on, we could do most of our business and shopping in Delia. And then I also talk about childbirth. I mean, midwives and the death of the children. One family had a horrendous record of successive um, deaths and that eventually, when they were able to go to the hospital in Red Deer to give birth. I mean, that was a huge, huge achievement and a change in status because they prospered. They were entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. uh, they bought teams of horses and machinery and they would do all of the threshing in the region. I mean, so you see, uh, you know, that entrepreneurship. And and, and uh, as you described, like women were were key to to the oh. economic fortunes for a, for a family, right? They, while while men maybe have were working on the rail railway or in the mines, they were tending to the garden. They were uh, baking bread to sell it to other community members. Yeah. They were mending clothes, so they were they were key to the family's fortune. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 related. This is like uh, uh, you know moving forward in in time, but I really liked um, a quote. Uh, again, from the book, um, the pattern is the first generation gets an economic foothold and the second generation gets educated. So even though this was spoken about a family who emigrated in the early 1900s um, uh, to work in the mines, I think it was the, 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 the Cafaro family. Um, it was a consistent theme, I think, as, as the generations came. So how was education seen as a key to betterment for men, but also, and I think maybe more importantly for women, uh, for for immigrants, uh, yeah, I, was, I was surprised at the number of women and in different communities that uh, finished their education and 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 went into went into teaching. Uh, for example, one of the women who I cite um, was one of the first babies in the Venice High Low agricultural colonies founded in 1914. And Mary Biolo, her father, O.J. Biolo, was one, one of the founders, uh, became a school teacher um, and, and taught in, in, in the Lac La Biche area because initially before there was a school at Venice, the kids went to school at Lac La Biche and learned French, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. you, know, so that you, 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 you get that relationship with the, the Francophone com community in, in that area. And so, education um, became important um, even in those early times. And, and so I cite those, um, those ex examples because frankly, a woman um, who was educated was doubly an asset to her husband and her family because she was not just the hands that did various things, that there was mm -hmm. an intellect uh, at play. Mm -hmm. um, I, just to switch a, a focus for a, a little bit, and I know I've jumped time periods a little bit, and so I just wanted to ask also, um, so the book describes different waves, and, and you talked about uh, some of the excerpts, the early, uh, some of the early Italian uh, immigrants who came. Um, so for example, there was the, early, the late 1800s, the early 1900s as one, 
uh, wave. And then the post World War II wave was another one. And so th those experiences were very different. I was wondering if you could comment about uh, some of the similarities, but then also the differences with those different waves. Well, you know, really, I, I talk about uh, three waves of immigration. Um, 1861, and I mean, I, I found records of, all, of Italians in Alberta from the early 1880s. I mean, the um, 1883 was when the um, CPR arrived in, in Calgary and, and Italians were working and Shaughnessy, uh, the head of the CPR was saying, look, you know, for uh, the rail work workers um, to lay the tracks, you don't want uh, Brits. Mm -hmm. uh, because they'll expect hot baths, um, you know, a feather bed and <laughs> so on. And, and he said, you know, you want those uh, Italians and others who are prepared to, to, to work as hard as they can, to work all the hours that you give them because they have a reason to work hard and, 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 um, and save. So mm -hmm. I think, that, you know, they, they had that... Um, that reputation as hard workers. Now, according to the, the census records, I think around 1900, there were 109 Italians in, in Alberta, but by, you know, with the surge in the opening of the mines in the Crow's Nest Pass area, um, in, in, um, in uh, Blairmore, there, there were 150, 200 uh, miners, so that you saw uh, the concentration um, in, of, 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 of Italians in certain resource areas. Mm -hmm. And that in that area, you had more than you had in Edmonton or Calgary. But of course, Italians were not natural miners. <laughs> in, in Northern Italy, in the mountainous areas, you know, they dug tunnels in the mountains for, and all of that. And if you had had some railway work, uh, um, and, and digging tunnels. So those who hated mining and had trades moved into, you know, set up the, the company, you know, the company store in the, in the, in the coal mining mm -hmm. community ripped you off. So Italians decided to set up their, um, um, their own little stores. Um, uh, the, sh the shoe repairs, um, you know, all, all, all of those trade, um, things and a lot then got into construction. I mean, if you're into um, historic uh, structures, um, you know, the, the suite of buildings um, in uh, the Blairmore, in Blairmore in particular, that are designated provincial historic uh, resources were designed and built by an Italian. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, you begin to see then those Italians who excelled in construction. And that was the same across the country, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, not only were there, there were different waves and the experiences were different, but uh, the Italians that came were coming from different parts of Italy as well in the different waves. I was wondering if you could uh, comment on that as well. Sure, um, from the statistics that I, I found, um, about two thirds of the early immigration was from Northern Italy. And that, you know, were generally, you know, they were better off than in the South. But on the other hand, the um, steamship companies and labor agents had located on the border between um, Southern Switzerland and Italy, in particular one area, Chiasso. And so it was very easy for those workers, particularly from the rural areas to go there and to sign up. Now, Basically, you know, they paid everything because they, they, you know, they would get their dibs on your pay. I mean, the labor mm -hmm. agents. So it, it, it wasn't altruistic, although those who didn't have family to sponsor them, which was, you know, a good two thirds. This was your only way of getting a ticket over here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in terms of immigration, the First World War, basically, it, it ceased. And although Italians were not enemy aliens, because initially they toyed who they were going to side with, but eventually they sided with the allies. But after the war, immigration became even more restrictive. So in, in the period, say 1919 to 
1939, the only way you could get into the country was as an agricultural laborer or if you were sponsored. And in that period, I calculated about 800, 900 came. The flood tides opened um, after the Second World War. And from 1950 to about 1970, I think 350,000, um, um, you know, came. I mean, and, and so it really was a flood. And the preferred destinations, of course, were Eastern Canada, Ontario, and and Quebec, and, and the resource hint interlands in those provinces. Then the third uh, most attractive area to settle was British Columbia. And, and then, of course, the prairies, um, going back to the building of the CPR, mm -hmm. that, that's how that began, and, and the coal mines. Um, with respect to immigration, the post-war wave of immigration, uh, Alberta became incredibly attractive because of the coming in of Leduc number one in 1947. And that, you know, uh, the, the Veltri family, which changed their name to Welch, um, uh -huh. the brothers um, Giovanni and Vincenzo, uh, arrived in North America in, in the 1880s, worked in the US and the Pacific Northwest, then built 13 kilometers of railway in the Crow's Nest Pass area. They built canals. I mean all across the country and then um, settled in, 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 in Ontario, Thunder Bay. There, uh, the, um, John's son, Ralph, kept the company alive. And, he, and in that third wave of immigration, he was one of the principal labor, labor agents. He came from Italy, my hometown mm -hmm. in Calabria. And he brought in gangs of men to work for the CNR in Northern um, Alberta and British Columbia. And so, you know, a lot of them, um, you know, came. And then a number of them worked in, in, the, in, the, um, in the refinery. My father in 1949 went to work for New West Construction owned by the uh, uh, Niagara Anselmo family uh -huh. uh, started in the 1920s. And they were subcontractors to Imperial Oil. And so dad, after two years working for New West, was taken on by Imperial Oil. Uh -huh. So you, you see, you know, that evo evolution. And, and uh, as you mentioned, like the post-war, uh, World War II wave, um, a lot of Italians came. But there was a bit of a, a blip uh, between the wars. Uh, and so I wanted to ask about that because the policy had to, Canada had to change their policy because previous to that, um, in chapter six, you spent a lot of time talking about, and this was a fascinating, scary and fascinating section that I didn't realize, but, um, or I, I knew a little bit from your, some of your other writing, but uh, uh, when, when Canada had declared war on uh, Italy, the Italians were designated as, uh, you know, aliens or, or enemies, enemies. And um, so I was curious if you could uh, 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 talk about that experience for what happened to Italians. And I think you might read a passage also uh, related to that because Italians, because they were designated, were then interred as, as prisoners. Yes. Well, I'll go back. I mean, 1922 is when Mussolini came to power. And of course, he wanted to build a, a strong united Italy hearkening back to the symbols of the Roman past and the Roman empire, you know, the fasci, the, the sticks, cross sticks, you know, with the ribbon around them. I mean, and that the uh, fascio um, also became the name of a fa small fascist organization, a, fa a cell. And uh, as soon as he came to power, um, he knew that there were uh, a lot of Italians abroad who were sending money and that he wanted to woo them. And so, you know, he, he made use of various people. And the person that he sent um, at, at, at the end of, of, of 1922, at the beginning of 1923, was Italia Garibaldi, the granddaughter of Giuseppe Garibaldi, the Italian freedom fighter and one of the fathers of Italian independence. 
And Italia um, was well known in the US as were her brothers who were generals who had fought in the First World War, um, had distinguished themselves. And so the family was doing these tours. And so she not only, she came ostensibly to explore setting up more agricultural colonies. And she was in, um, in Alberta the first week of January and she visited Edmonton, Calgary and Venice Hilo. And the Edmonton and Calgary press lionized her. And, but she was also proselytizing. She was promoting fascism. And this would, and, and fascist cells were set up in 1924, 25 in Edmonton, Calgary, um, Lethbridge um, and, uh, and Venice. And the, in 1926, a provincial fascia was set up in Calgary. And right away, the, the tension um, emerged that in the, in, in, in the pages of the Herald, you see the articles in which she talks about fascism and how wonderful it, mm -hmm. it was for Italy and how great these settlers were going to be and others who opposed fascism. Of course, when it, everything changed in the mid 1930s, um, when the relationship between Mussolini and Hitler solidified, mm -hmm. and Hitler bore, and um, Mussolini bore a page from Hitler's handbook about land and the need for land, you know, for the fatherland or motherland. And so, you know, we get the Abyssinian Ethiopian campaign. And so the RCMP had been tracking Italians probably from 1926 onwards because eventually Mussolini replaced the war heroes who became consuls in the post-World War I era with fascist trained um, uh, concert officials. And one from, it from Edmonton went to Italy for that training. Mm -hmm. And so eventually then, um, June the 10th, uh, Italy declared war on the United Kingdom, Canada, of course, came into the war and the RCMP already had their lists. They mm -hmm. had informants in Italian communities across the country and about 650 people were interned and 31,000 were designated um, enemy aliens. And, and there, was a, there was a lot of tension within communities too, from what, oh, I, what I read. Um, um, it Italians couldn't trust Italians because they didn't know where their sympathies were. And so that uh, uh, contributed, yeah. It was, a, it was a dark time. I mean, not only, you know, did you have to have an identity card, you had to report to the RCMP. I mean, all of this. And that in some communities, the RCMP were draconian. In other mm -hmm. communities, they were friends. And so it, it, it varied. Mm -hmm. I'd like for my final reading, if, if we've got time. Yes, please. No, I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to this this uh, this part because I, I found this uh, the story about uh, Antonio uh, Rebeldengo, if I remember correctly, uh, quite fascinating with the letters that he, that were kept and sent yeah. to his wife. Yes. I mean, there, uh, you know, these letters are unique uh, and and give you a level of detail that is incredible. And I'll just begin with Romano Tedesco, who was from the Venice Hilo area, in a 1973 interview said, some people from Venice went to concentration camp. Italians spied on other Italians and reported them to the authorities. You had to keep your thoughts and beliefs to yourself. But many talked badly about Mussolini. You had to watch who you talk to. If Italians had not spied on each other, the authorities would not have known anything. And of course he was designated an, an enemy alien. And initially it, anyone who had been naturalized after September 1st, 1929 could be designated um, an enemy alien. Others who weren't naturalized of course were viewed as uh, as part of you know that foreign nation, um, mm -hmm. and then they backed that up to September the first, nineteen twenty-two. You know, which was mm -hmm. 
really widening um, that net. And there were six Alberta internees, um, O.J. Biolo and Rudolf McKechty from um, Venice Hilo, Antonio Rebalvengo from Calgary, um, Giovanni Galdi from uh, the um, Coleman, Can you know, the, the mining areas, Emilio Sereni who worked in, in the railways in, in Calgary and um, Santo Romeo who I also uh, believe um, worked no, Sereni was a homesteader and Santa Romeo worked on the railways. And I will now um, read. Uh, Rebaldengo came around 1922 with his infant son, Mario, and his wife, Angelina. He was well educated. They were both well educated. He ended up working um, in the, as a machinist in the railway yards uh, in Calgary. And they also then became, um, uh, he became a consular agent. And it's mm -hmm. clear that he, he was a, a fascist and he, he had espoused that youthful vision of, of Italy and, you know, this proud homeland before he came to Canada. And um, he then was arrested on June the 10th, 1940, and was held until August the 10th in the Calgary Mounted Police Barracks. From August 1910 to 1940 to July 1941, he was at Kananaskis internment camp. And then from August 1941 to July 1942 in Camp Petawawa, Ontario. And then from August 1942 to September 1943 in the Gagetown camp near Fredericton, New Brunswick. So he served about three years. Um, some of other hardcore fascists, uh, mostly from Ontario and Quebec, served until 1945. And I mean, th there was an appeal process, um, uh, you know, that the appeals were heard by Mr. Justice Heinemann, Peter Heinemann's grandfather, I mean, mm -hmm. and so that, and that, you know, Revalvengo, with the help of his wife, you know, put in a bunch of appeals, but they, they did not work. And clearly he had enemies um, in the uh, Calgary community. And I, mm -hmm. and I identify those because I was able to do that through the oral histories. Um, and he, I'll just read you a couple of things from his letters. Um, I mentioned in a previous letter, it is problematic to write and I allowance and incidentally, these were translated from the okay. Italian. And I outlined some of the reasons. For the moment, I have found a subject. I'll jump from one topic to another, not making sense, believing what is not true, since the pen is free to write what it likes, even if my thoughts are different. After nine months in prison, one cannot expect to be in the right frame of mind. But I remember one of the Ten Commandments, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I feel ashamed in being unproductive, clothed, maintained and cared for by the government, which needs lots of money to wage the war victoriously. Um, you know, I'll just read you a couple of things. Um, 8th of April, um, this would have been um, 1941. Yesterday and today were two days since I came to the camp in which I truly worked with a few comrades and we cleared and leveled a new place to play bolche among the hardest working was Rodolfo Migueti. Well, he was in his early twenties, you know, uh -huh. a, a farm boy. 10th of April, my wife continues to complain that only one in three of my letters arrive. Since the content is not inflammatory and even if the censor doesn't like it, why not cancel or cut, but by God send her at least a piece of the letter. Uh -huh. um, and so clearly some, people, um, powerful people within the Italian community had, you know, cited chapter and verse um, in terms of his um, fascist um, beliefs and, and, you know, what, what he had done or, th or threatened to do. And so um, he obsesses. I mean, you can see the periods of depression. He uses... Um, Image, he 
sees himself as a Christ-like figure. Um, so you, 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 you see all of this and you see the toll, not only on him, but on his young son, who eventually um, um, is, is called up mm -hmm. and is, is in the military. And Antonio believes that, you know, this should mean that he will be freed, but he's not. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's absolutely gut-wrenching and haunting. Were they, was the Canadian government through the War Measures Act justified in doing this? Um, you know, I mean, they were worried about the enemies within, the third columnists. And um, I think that some of the people that they arrested definitely were hardcore communists. The question is whether they could have prejudiced the Canadian war effort and mm -hmm. think about the coal mines. Um, you know, there, there's NFB films that were done and some Italians are featured um, in, in those NFB films. Um, railways, of course, had to be secure because can you imagine how much freight was carried to, su to supply? The Canadian troops um, on on the front. I mean, so and, and as well as the Allies. Yes, um, Adriana. The, uh, I'm glad. That it's it's sad that we have to uh, wrap up there, but I think that that's just an indication of how uh, with uh, with those letters as an example of how rich uh, the research that you were able to find, um, and and not only provide uh, facts about the lives of these Italian Canadian uh, immigrants, but also paint a picture of their life and bring, bring to life these characters. Um, but sadly, we, we have to uh, wrap up. Um, and I wanted to uh, just say thank you again for, for sharing what you've shared. Um, uh, the richness that's in the book, I hope others will get it. And just to, to, to profile it here, uh, from sojourners to citizens, uh, from Guernica Editions, a wonderful book. Um, so I wanted to say thank you, Adriana, for uh, taking the time to uh, chat with me about uh, some of the questions. I know we, we could have gone on, we have other questions, um, but we'll have to do that another time. And a thank you to the Writers Guild of Alberta for those who've tuned in and to Dorothy for helping us with the tech. And I echo those sentiments. And, and thank you so much for being such an able interrogator and host. <laughs> Thank you, Adriana. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.